I was a certified canine instructor for a number of years, training canine officers. I also taught uh, canine training, advanced training, specialized training, and a course in olfaction, canine olfaction, forensics, and the law for anthrozoology uh, course of study at Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Did that for 10 years and the canine instructor for 20 years. So this is where I picked up a lot of this information or at least looked for it. Well, I think people like it so much because there's so much in the in the hunting world about scents and <laughs> scent control and it's it's nice to have a, a a conversation that's that's really backed by something other than what a company is claiming about a product. Cuz that's that's what we've heard about it up until we have conversations with guys like yourself. Okay, true. Yeah, this stuff because it was done for K9. This is this is university uh, based research, peer reviewed. This is the real McCoy. Uh, uh, so, it's not anecdotal evidence. It's it's scientifically proven. Uh, now we're talking a little bit about the human scent signature. So, Tom, kind of walk us through this, and we'll kind of dive into again like these specific topics here. Well, like I said, humans each have a unique scent signature. For the purposes of deer hunting, doesn't matter that it's unique. It's a human scent signature. It will come off of you. Ordinarily speaking, you are warmer than ambient temperature. So your scent will come off and rise off your body. And if you're moving, it'll fall behind you as it cools. We call this a thermal plume. Uh, and once it hits behind you and you're moving, you're creating basically a wake, just like a boat has a wake. It's called the vortex street in scientific terms, but it's basically like the wake of a boat, and that's your scent. So the farther you move, the wider that wake is back there, and it narrows up as you get uh, close. So that is what's coming off of you and going behind you. If you're sitting still, it just comes off and goes back down, uh, and that is what is available partially for the deer to smell with that I, I guess when we're talking about like how your scent is rising off your body and again kind of displaying around you whether you're moving and it's kind of waking up behind you, like you're mentioning or say someone's in a uh, stationary position and kind of how it's rising and then falling around them kind of cascading i guess you could say what would that mean for somebody from you know walking into an area and i know we're going to get to ground scent and ground disturbance right. and stuff as well in this presentation and this podcast uh, but Specifically, if someone's like in a tree stand, elevated, versus somebody sitting on the ground, how would that affect the, the distribution of that scent molecule? Well, as that scent comes off of you, cools and settles, it is now at, at the mercy of any wind, any thermal, any convection currents, anything like that, even elevation, because it'll roll downhill. We'll cover that in a minute. So it's at the mercy of the elements at that point, which is why... You like to position yourself downwind from deer. Now, also, one thing you've got on the screen is talking about uh, breath and sweat. When you're looking at the scent coming off a, a human being, is it something that's also is coming out of like all the pores of your body and any exposed skin? Is it coming out of, or is it mostly out of your breath and breathing? Depends on if you're you've exerted yourself, uh, because it comes out in the sweat glands, both apocrine and ecrine. The ecrine sweat glands are thermoregulated, so if you are exerting yourself and you've breaking into a sweat, it, you're exuding scent from all over. If you haven't, then you're, the bulk of it is going to be in your breath. Even if you're breathing through your nose, you're excluding scent. Oh, yeah. Or excreting scent, you I guess that's right. Can't avoid it. Okay, interesting. See, and that comes back to a conversation which we're going to have in throughout this, or throughout this podcast is, um, you know, you're talking scent control or something like that. People like to treat their clothing and treat their skin and stuff, but... It doesn't seem like anyone's ever figured out the whole method of treating your breath. Again, breathing out your nose where you're excreting this scent. And there doesn't really seem to be any way that, at least I'm aware of currently, a way to be able to mitigate that at all, correct? You're exactly right. Okay. There isn't a way to mitigate it. So the scent rule. Scent rule, basic scent rules for how scent uh, moves. Of course, scent is composed of airborne molecules, period. Uh Elevation, pressure, heat, all will affect how that moves. And very basically speaking, without interference from thermals and the like, 
scent will roll downhill at the rate of 14 feet per one degree of declination. Uh, another one of the little rules, wind will affect the scent in this way. It will move at 10 feet for every one mile an hour of wind. Any scent coming off of you will tend to cling to vegetation. Vegetation, the surface of it is porous because part of its job is to trap CO2 molecules. Well, it traps other molecules too. Uh, scent will also cling to water at least temporarily. The surface of the water is covered with oxygen molecules and that's what we call a sticky molecule. They don't bond, but they just kind of stick for a little while and then they'll, it'll drift off. The other things that are going to affect it, like I said, is temperature. The hotter it is, the faster the molecules move. They will have a tendency to gravitate toward areas of cool. Uh, so if you're in, you know, you have a spot in the shade, downwind from your track, that's where it's going to be. Just little things like that to remember when you're tracking in and out of a hunt area. So How long will it, your molecules stay on a, like a piece of vegetation for? Okay, good question again. It depends on the environmental factors, but these, all the scent that's coming off you because it's airborne molecules, this will be the first thing to dissipate. Okay. Okay. Before any of the, the scent you've caused on the ground, uh, these airborne molecules off of you will dissipate quicker. Uh, we will, we found that out, you know, with tracking dogs. If you put a dog on a track five minutes after it was laid, the dog will run head up because he can still smell that scent band. If you wait an hour and a half, he'll be nose to the ground because all that stuff's gone. So. Same could be said of deer. So if you're walking in and you have the luxury of an hour or so to get to your stand before you start to hunt, that would help. Okay. Also, one other thing I, I was thinking about, and I know we're going to get to ground disturbance because I know okay. ground disturbance lasts a lot longer based off our last interview with you uh, than just your scent that's in the air column and also sent its dispersion to the ground. When, when we're talking about as a whitetail hunter, if, a, if someone's looking at access specifically to a stand location that they're trying to hunt and trying to leave the least amount of odor, least amount of scent, you know, you have people talking about rubber boots, uh, tucking in rubber boots and stuff like that in order to try to, you know, hopefully mitigate some kind of scent compared to like maybe a leather boot. Um, and then also just finding different access paths or, or ways to travel to a stand location. What are some of those factors that, first off, would allow someone to maybe leave the least amount of some of that disturbance okay. compared to other options. Can't tell you about the footwear part of it, but to leave less ground disturbance and ground scent, you want to go to something with a minimum amount of vegetation. Basically, the harder the surface, the less of that is going to stay for very long. Okay. Okay. Whether it's rocks, whether it's macadam, whatever. Uh, that would be the thing. But you also have to bear in mind, if you're on hard-packed dirt, there are, there's microbes in the dirt that will exude scents when you step on them, even though you can't see them. So, but still, that's better than going through vegetation. When, when we're talking about um, environmental scents, what, what are some of the factors specifically on a topic like this that, you know, hunters or outdoorsmen should be aware of when it comes to okay. that option. In the environmental sense, what we're referring to here is uh, disturbed vegetation by you walking on it, cutting it, whatever. But when you disturb vegetation, chloroplast will leak out. That will create a scent uh, that is meant to alert the other plants and sometimes the animals to the fact that this is damaged goods. Uh, deer will key in on that for a number of reasons. You know, one is if other deer have been the things that do the damage because they've been eating it, well, that just lets the other deer know this is the place. This is good to go. But uh, the environmental sense fr from you will be caused by your walking through. If it's a minimal amount of uh, disturbance or, or crushing of the vegetation, it'll be what they call a primary 
biogenic VOC. Those and the primary ones are the quickest ones to go away, basically. They will uh, be consumed, that chloroplast, the, the VOC molecules, will be consumed by bacteria in the atmosphere within 1.07 hours. So that, if you haven't disturbed too much, the sign of your passage is gone after an hour. Uh, secondary VOCs, same principle, but you've done some heavy damage somehow to the environment. Those will last longer, but they have the same effect as far as when they emit their VOCs, they're also attacked by bacteria. And they're also consumed, but it takes a lot longer. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is pretty intensive damage. This is broken branches. This is, you know, cutting firewood, that kind of thing. Uh, however, they will exude scent uh, that's viable for up to 60 days. It's not so much they, but it's the bacteria that attacks them. That's what they call a bacterial VOC. That's what's exuding the scent. That's what the animals are paying attention to. Because that, you know, the, the root of it was damage to the vegetation. So, that's that's it in a nutshell, but for every, every VOC that is given off by a plant, every one, like, and there's hundreds of them, for every one of them, there's 22 to 82 bacterial VOCs that attack it. So the bacterial stuff is what we're mainly interested in. That's what lasts the longest. An example of that, uh, of this something you were talking about, like the, like the larger broken branches or something that they could, you know, have that scent that would last so much longer. I think that if from a whitetail hunter, you hear a lot of people talk about not wanting to cut shooting lanes for tree stands anytime with, you know, very close to season. Like they want to do it way out in advance right. and, you know, from disturbing the deer. And I think a lot of people don't realize, again, the technical, you know, scientific understanding of that, but you know, just seeing that per personally deer react negatively to that large landscape trimming uh, that someone may do in an area that those deer aren't used to it, you know, outside of, you know, maybe logging practices or something like that. Uh, and that's kind of what you're talking about there specifically is, you know, that large uh, uh, type of damage, again, damaging branches and stuff like that, trimming that specifically could leave that scent around for potentially a, a quite a long time, up to potentially 60 days, correct? And it, it could alarm the deer, but you have to take into account what else is going on in that area. If there's a whole lot of animals, they're doing a whole lot of damage. This is not a foreign smell to them. If there's big animals, there's cattle, for instance, it's not a foreign smell. I was thinking today, because I don't really have an answer, but like you said, trimming for uh, shooting lanes or worse yet, cutting down a bunch of stuff to brush in a ground blind. Mm. Obviously, it works sometimes, doesn't bother them. But in those times, you'll notice when it does work, that's because you and the blind are both downwind of where you expect the deer to show up. 